Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Janina Jeff, staff bioinformatics scientist here at Illumina, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Naomi. Hi, Naomi. Hi, my name is Naomi Kinsey, and I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Washington. Um, I have an MPH in global health, also from the University of Washington, and I'm very excited to be here today. You are the first and only medical student that I've spoken to <laughs> at the conference, but you are well accomplished. Thank you. You've done a lot of things, um, including you were on our panel earlier today. Yes. Tell us a little bit about some of the things you discussed on the panel. Yeah, the panel was a lot of fun. Um, I think kind of the main thing that we discussed was about how equity is, or the way I think about it, equity is about relinquishing power. Mm. So the other panelists talked about how when they do genomics research, focusing on getting the communities that you're getting their data from really active in the whole research process. So getting their buy-in, also making sure that they're getting the actual results of the data, and then any kind of pharma pharmaceutical products that come from it, that they're able to have access to it as well. So kind of shifting the mindset and taking the power away from these large um, institutions and trying to give some of that back to the communities as well. You know, and in some cases, also getting results back is not as meaningful, right. particularly if you are in an under uh, underserved population, understudied population. So can you talk to me a little bit about what you think like equitable, equitable benefit looks like in this relationship? Yeah, so I think giving people results that they can actually do something with, right? So I am going into family practice, which is primary care. And when I talk to patients, I have such a short period of time to actually interact with those patients. So first, ensuring that people are actually able to come to clinic and that they're actually able to have time with their physicians that are ordering these tests to explain the importance of them, explain the results, and explain the next steps. I think a lot of these communities have a rightful distrust of science and medicine just because of the historic harms that we've caused. Um, so making sure that when they are face-to-face -face with people that are kind of encouraging them to get testing, that they're able to pass along the information in a way that is understandable and approachable. So we're talking about um, having this equally beneficial relationship between patients, their providers, researchers. Can you talk to me a little bit about what you think that is? What does it look like? Yeah, so I think what that looks like is that when the researchers are going out into these communities to get data, that the communities have buy-in to the work that's being done. So they're kind of the guiding light of who we're willing to work with, what kind of data we're willing to um, give to their researchers, and then also what are we getting in return? So if, we're, if these communities are not getting their data back, they're not getting the benefit of the pharmaceuticals that are coming from it, they're not getting the benefit of getting the kind of low-cost tests at um, their healthcare facilities that other people are getting access to, then of course they're not gonna wanna participate. And as a scientist and, and a person who loves data, we're always coming across these, um, what we now call social determinants of health that are right. teaching us so much more. Um, a few years ago, I read this book called The Medical Apartheid. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of it? Yes. Okay, <laughs> I assume you've read it. <laughs> uh, in that book, and in, in general, there's been a lot of conversation about what are some of the racist practices that are actually mm. happening in medicine. And I know you've worked on some of these. Uh, particularly, I know you've worked on one in your, in, your, in your medical career, your medical school career. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And, and what, tell us that story. Yeah, yeah. So... <sighs> So much, in, so much is talked about in terms of interpersonal racism at the doctor's office. Mm. That I think that what a lot of the public doesn't know, and even some physicians don't know, is that there's racism built into the very tools that we use in our office. So when talking about kidney disease, when someone comes to the doctor because um, kidney concerns, we have a test that we call estimated glomerular filtration rate, which kind of broadly measures how well the kidneys are working. Broadly speaking, higher EGFR is better kidney function, lower EGFR is worse kidney function. So ideally, you think that these tests would be equitable across everyone that's using it. Um, the reality is that in our calculations for EGFR, race is taken into consideration in these algorithms, mm -hmm. particularly if someone is black versus non-black. So if a patient is identified as black, their EGFR value is artificially bumped up, so that it looks like they have better kidney functioning than they might actually have. So what this means is that black patients actually have to be much sicker than non-black patients in order to get 
to meet the threshold for access to specialized kidney care, for transplants, for certain medications. Um, so it, it's something that really contributes to uh, disparities in kidney health. Of course, it's not the only factor, but it's one that is so blatantly obvious and um, so incredible that it's hasn't like really been um, changed up until recently. And you were a part of that change. Yes. <laughs> so that's a really important part because the EGFR calculation, I mean, it's being it's still being used right. several different places. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you were able to 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 make some change happen there. Yeah, so I first learned about this equation my first year of medical school. It was I think 3 months into medical school. And part of our curriculum, we do reading first and then we go to lecture. So I was doing the reading and I came across this equation. I was like, oh, this doesn't make sense. So if you're black, you get to <laughs> multiply it by different but also, values. what does black even mean? Yeah, what does black <laughs> even mean? Um, so I was like, okay, this, this can't be right. So I started looking into the primary data. And what I found was that black race was brought into the equation based on the assumption that black people have more muscle mass. So the equation needs to be adjusted for our extra muscle mass because black people are supposedly more muscular than all other groups of people. Um, so when I heard about this, I brought it up in lecture. I asked the professor, you know, you discussed this equation, but you didn't bring up why black race is um, taken into consideration. And he was like, well, you know, this is just what the data shows. And I was like, well... Does the data show that? Does because, it? <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know if that's what the data is showing. So I kind Feels of was, racist. Yeah, I, I was pushing and I was like, well, okay, so what if I'm half black? Mm. Which equation do you use? What if I am black, but you don't recognize me as black because maybe I'm lighter skin? Would you also, would I still get the, the equation? What if, um, you know, I have some black ancestry, but I'm not, you know, both parents aren't black, then what happens? Um, and then also, interestingly, when you look at some other countries, particularly in Africa, they don't make those kinds of adjustments. So if you go from one country to another, all of a sudden your kidneys work differently because you're black. So it, it really doesn't make sense. And when you think about, you know, transplant services, if someone gets a transplant from a different race, do you use a different equation now because of that? That's a good point. Um, so kind of bringing up this discussion to my professors and I was met with a lot of pushback. Really? <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> yeah, the hierarchy of medicine is very, very strong okay. still. Okay, okay. Um, so, you know, I mentioned that this was something that I brought up my first year of medical school. It wasn't until the end of my third year that the University of Washington ultimately decided to make this change. So this was three years worth of advocacy work. Um, in addition to being a full-time medical student. In addition to being a full-time full medical student. You are also an <laughs> activist. Okay. <Yeah. laughs> so um, University of Washington officially made the change. So they decided to use this equation without the race coefficient. And they were, um, after University of Washington made this change, several other universities followed suit. And what ended up happening is that so much attention was brought to this issue. So I you know, I purposely was like, I'm going to go talk to the public. I went to CNN, I went to NPR, I presented at South by Southwest, I published papers, and I think getting while more... While being a medical student. <laughs> while Just being a medical student. Everyone needs to know this. She works really hard. <laughs> um, so, you know, bringing more attention to this, I think, really put pressure on the National Kidney Foundation and the American Society of Nephrology to make a statement. So they ultimately came out with a statement um, kind of calling out racism in their own institutions. Um, myself and other students um, started this organization um, that was working, that had a working group on EGFR. So I'm part of a, an organizing member of a group called the Institute for Healing and Justice in Medicine. And we started a working group on EGFR and met with the chief medical officer of the Kidney Foundation and really pushed towards these changes. So ultimately, they put together a task force, which anybody in health equity, you hear task force, you're like, all right, this is dead in the water. <laughs> They're just gonna talk about this and not make any changes. Yeah. Um, but the official recommendation came out earlier this year in June that it's no longer appropriate to use race in calculations of EGFR. Wow. So. Huge, huge round of applause to thank you. Thank you, thank you. I mean, I can't, I know that feeling. Uh, it has to be a really good one. You're literally saving lives and you haven't even graduated medical school yet. <laughs> um, 
But when we talk about kidney disease, let's let's talk about genetics a little bit mm -hmm. because uh, I did my postdoc training at Mount Sinai Hospital, and when I was there, we had I was actually working under a nephrologist mm -hmm. in precision medicine, and that was when I first learned about APOL1 and the genetic variation in APOL1 in kidney disease. I want to talk a little bit about that because mm -hmm. I have seen some healthcare systems replace the use of race for genetic exactly. ancestry, and I think. And we've historically made this mistake of just taking it and, and kind of just mm -hmm. like running with it instead of like, let's look at some data. So right. tell me your thoughts about that, because I imagine that's some of the pushback you might have gotten. Yeah, um, in medicine, people are very imprecise with their language, right? So ancestry is different from race. <laughs> yes, it is. And oftentimes what we mean by race is actually ancestry in medicine. So we'll use race as a proxy, right? So I think about like someone like my mom, for example, who is from the Democratic Republic of Congo, but because of Congo's colonial history, she has some Portuguese ancestry. But people would say, oh, she's black. All of her ancestry must come from Africa, right? Without really thinking more um, in depth. So I think when we talk about genomics in kidney, um, we talk about the APOL gene. And I think what people don't recognize is that this gene is common in all groups of people where malaria is prevalent. So it's not just, you know, African ancestry, but also South American, Mediterranean, all those areas of the world where malaria is something that is um, endemic. Tell me, what does five to 10 years later Ooh. look like? What does success look like in the work that you do? Yeah, so um, ideally I will go into family medicine. You will. Residency <laughs> applications just went out, so we'll see You're a match day. In there. <laughs> I hope you match somewhere fun. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, so I think my work, one, I want to center in community. So um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to specialize in, something that I think was um, a thought that I had throughout all of my rotations is how do I connect this to community? Mm. And I felt that family medicine was a specialty that really focuses on meeting people where they're at, looking at both the individual patient, but also how their health and their lives impact the people around them. Super exciting. Okay, so I'm hoping for more stories to come from you. I'm excited to hear about more stories to come from you. I also want to say congratulations. Thank I you. I heard recently you won some big award. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so I was announced today as a 2002 um, Pisacano Scholar. Um, thank you. So the Pisacano um, Scholars Program is run by the American Board of Family Physicians or Family Medicine, and it's the highest award given to trainees going into family medicine. So wow. it's a huge honor. <laughs> um, it's one that I'm very proud of and yeah, I'm excited to just have been recognized. Yeah, well, congratulations. And I'm so inspired by you. Uh, I think it's great that you center the community and the work that you're doing. And uh, it's just such an important aspect of all of the work that we've been talking about here. What are some of the biggest takeaways that you're taking away from the meeting? Oh my gosh. I think the biggest takeaway is that there's still so much work to be done. Oh yes. Yeah, yes. I, I think. It, You'll be busy. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, more things we'll to do. Busy. Yeah, yeah. So I am inspired by you and I Thank am you. so looking forward to the future and all the things that you're going to continue to work on. So thank you so much for talking with yeah, me today. Yeah, thank you for having me. And now we know each other. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.